But I love it. It's like just theory. Yeah. Yeah. All right, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming today. We're going to get started. My name is Matthew Meyer. I'm privileged really to being a chairperson of the Institute of Bill of Rights Law Chief Division this year. And uh, before I introduce our speaker, which is Deputy Solicitor General Edwin Meather, I would like to uh, first thank Professor Devins and Melody Nichols for their work in organizing uh, today's lunch. Also, I'd like to offer two reminders. Uh, the first is that tonight at 5 p.m. In, in the courtroom, we will be presenting Mr. Neither with the Silver Tongue Award for Oral Advocacy. And uh, Mr. Neither will preside as Chief Justice over the final round of the Bushrod Moot uh, Court competition, where 1L Jessica Delaney will be arguing for the petitioner, and 1L Tessa Vincent will be arguing for the respondent. And just to give you an idea of the quality of argument that uh, we've had at this tournament over the uh, past years, the 2009 Bush Rod finalists, Stephen Berry and Brandon Boxler, uh, this past weekend beat 34 teams to win the 21st annual National First Amendment Moot Court Competition at Vanderbilt. And also, if you need additional incentive, there's a catered reception with wine and beer. <laughs> <laughs> My second reminder is that tomorrow, the Institute of Bill's Bill of Rights Law and the uh, William and Mary Law Review are co-sponsoring a conference entitled The State, the Citizen, and the Changing Role of Government. And we have uh, 12 well-known professors representing many of the top 10 law schools. And I hope to see many of you there because we already have two U's coming. Uh, Christopher Yu from the University of Pennsylvania <laughs> and John Yu uh, from Berkeley. So I hope to see you there, no pun intended. And if you have any questions about that conference, 3L Kevin Friends has done a great job of organizing it. She'll be the first to come. Now I have the privilege of introducing to you uh, Mr. Needler. Mr. Needler is the Senior Career De Deputy Solicitor General in the Office of the Solicitor General, which is the office in the United States that represents the uh, United States government before the Supreme Court. In 2009, he served as Acting Solicitor General before the confirmation of the late Hagan. Hagan. He has supervisor responsibilities for several areas of the United States cases that are in the Supreme Court docket, including uh, challenges to agency decisions, immigration law, federal benefits, natural resources, Native American law, and some international law issues. He also assists the Solicitor in General in deciding whether to take appeals in the lower courts in those areas. He has argued, uh, one of only eight people to have argued over 100 cases before the Supreme Court. He just told me that as of today, it's 111. He has argued uh, among those several controversial cases, including Ricci v. Stefano, Wyeth v. Levin, INS v. St. Cyr, Legal Services Corporation v. Velasquez, and Lujan v. Defenders of Wildlife. He has also filed amicus briefs and represented the government in other capacities in an additional 60 Supreme Court cases, represented the government in approximately 10 cases before the Circuit Courts of Appeals, and has also represented the government before uh, the District Courts of the United States, uh, most recently <coughs> in the Arizona immigration case. Before joining the Solicitor General's office, Mr. Needler served for four years in the Office of Legal Counsel in the Department of Justice, which was headed by then or, excuse me, by uh, now Justice Antonin Scalia. He clerked for Judge James R. Browning on the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. As a 1967 graduate of Lehigh University and a 1974 graduate of UVA. Today we'll be discussing the work of the Solicitor General's Office generally, as well as Supreme Court advocacy in general, and also reminiscing about uh, his experience in 30 years of arguing cases. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Deputy Solicitor General Needham. Thank you very much. Um, it's wonderful to be here. It's great to see um, all of you. And it's taking you back to 35 years ago, I guess, when I was uh, in your place. Um, and, uh, uh, a lot's happened since then, but, but in some ways, I, I Probably similar, um, similar to mine. Uh, when, when I um, read, well, when I went to law school, I actually had no idea what I was going to do with my career. I was going to just volunteer um, out on the West Coast, and I didn't know what I was going to do. And my brother said, "Why don't you think about law school?" And I said, "Okay, I'm going to law school." I thought I was. Going 
I'm Billy Lloyd, a uh, lawyer. As I, when I was just volunteer, there were some lawyers uh, for the migrant project. I, I worked in uh, uh, out of Oregon, and I greatly admired what they uh, accomplished. Uh, they uh, brought some of the first modern cases enforcing the anti peony law, uh, which were passed uh, after the Civil War, but were being uh, used to combat uh, the control that farmers were, were uh, imposing over, over migrant workers. So I went to law school with no idea and then just uh, loved it. I was a law geek in law school with no idea that that's what I would, uh, that's what I would do. And, and, and my career sort of unfolded by, uh, by chance after that. So uh, I guess my one, one piece of advice that I would give to you is to be open-minded in terms of what comes at you because I came with a very strong preconception of what I wanted to do with my career and, uh, and things turned out entirely uh, differently. Uh, and and uh, I guess my other piece of advice, it may not seem at this time of year, but is to enjoy law school because the, the, uh, the opportunity to soak in uh, uh, the law is something that once you get out and practice, uh, you really don't have time to reflect uh, on, on what you do. Maybe you, maybe you will, but you, you know, most of us are moving from one case to the project, one case to the next thing. And you don't necessarily have, to have an opportunity to appreciate the bigger picture uh, and to appreciate the, the, uh, the great traditions from which the American people uh, arrive. So that this is your this is your opportunity. This is your foundation. I guess I, I, guess I would encourage you uh, to go for it um, uh, in that. And um, I guess while I'm at it, I, I would also just put in a plug for public service. I feel so fortunate to have uh, worked with the Justice Department uh, for now, I guess, 35 years. And uh, <coughs> Justice Department, state, and local government. There are plenty of plenty of places, but it is an extremely sense of collegiality, not just in the Justice Department, but in the other federal agencies where we have attorneys and I'm sure you have a comparable experience elsewhere. So I, mean, I know there are a lot of uh, aspirations and possibilities and options out there or uh, things you might want to look at, but I just want to put in a plug for the public service. I thought I'd talk a little bit uh, at the outset about the Solicitor General's Office. I'm not sure how much you may uh, know about it, but um, People, I think a lot of people also are aware that the, the office represents the government and the Supreme Court, but there's actually uh, more to what to the office to work, and maybe I'll just sketch that out so that you can see where it fits in. The Solicitor General now is the fourth ranking person for Justice Department when the, when the office was created back in 1870 when the Department of Justice was created. The Solicitor General was the number two person in the United States Department, and the Solicitor General is responsible by statute for basically assisting the Attorney General in the conduct of litigation in, in the lower courts. Uh, that has come to mean basically the uh, lower courts and the Supreme Court. That has come to mean primarily the Supreme Court, but another important function the Solicitor General has is to authorize appeals from trial courts to courts of appeals whenever the government loses a case in uh, a lower court, a decision has to be made whether to take that appeal to uh, a higher court. Uh, typically, that's a, in the federal court system, it's one of the federal courts of appeals. And we have a very elaborate, some might say, bureaucratic system for uh, the conduct of appellate litigation. Typically, the, the attorney who worked on it at the trial court level will not be handling the appeal. And in, in the U.S. Attorney's offices, in the cases in the Sometimes they do, but the but the decision whether to appeal <coughs> has to be made by the Solicitor General, and the the, uh, the the theory. I mean, there's several reasons behind that. One is that uh, it's a good thing to have an independent look at the case after you, you may have probably had a good, good case in the trial court, uh, but you want somebody else to look uh, look at it uh, afresh <coughs> after you've lost in the trial court to see whether you can make it uh, to uh, to a court of appeals. Uh, and then we have a similar process that we lose a case in the Court of Appeals to decide whether to take it to the, uh, uh, to the Supreme Court. So that, that there are those responsibilities in the lower courts in addition to the Supreme Court that the Solicitor General also has to decide whether to uh, file uh, a dispute in the lower court, whether to seek a hearing on bond if the government loses a case in the Court of Appeals and wants the full Court of Appeals uh, uh, to hear it. Um, our office is relatively 
relatively small uh, in itself. The solicitor of General Lewis had advice and consent uh, appointee before deputy solicitor general of, of uh, which I'm one, and then we have 15 or 16 uh, assistants to the solicitor general who are the, who are the, the attorneys who do all of the brief writing and do all the work, I think. At least that's what they would say, and I would agree with them. Uh, but we don't, we don't do this uh, alone. Um, we, we get a great deal of uh, assistance from other parts of the <laughs> Justice Department. Um, the, the department is uh, now divided into basically seven litigating divisions. So the, uh, the government's litigation is divided up into those categories. The, the criminal division, the national security division, the civil rights division, the environment and natural resources division, the tax, antitrust, and the civil division. Uh, so those uh, those divisions are responsible for overseeing the trial court litigation and for actually handling the appeals and the courts of appeals after the Solicitor General has, has uh, approved them. But in our work, um, for instance, in preparing briefs in the Supreme Court, or in deciding whether to appeal, we get recommendations from those divisions, uh, or we get drafts of briefs from those divisions. So our our work is really in collaboration <coughs> with, uh, with the other uh, parts of the Justice Department and the other departments and agencies who would be involved in, um, in the litigation or, or interested uh, in it. Just to give you a picture about how that might work day to day because you know, from, from the outside you may not appreciate this, but, but we do have a very um, systematic way of deciding whether to uh, go forward in cases. I mean, let's take an example where we have lost a case in the Court of Appeals and the question is whether we should petition for certiorari to take the case to the Supreme Court. Well, we, um, one of the divisions, let's say the Environment Division in the Justice Department, is respect responsible for that type of case, the, that division would solicit recommendations from the other government agencies that might be interested uh, in the case. You might sometimes have just one agency, but sometimes you might have a number of agencies that would be interested because they have different subject matters or responsibilities, sometimes conflicting views within the government. Uh, so they, in that situation, the Environment Division would solicit those recommendations and then make its own recommendation to our office. Uh, and then it would be assigned to one of the assistants to the solicitor general to make his or her recommendation. It would come with a, solicitor, a deputy solicitor general uh, like myself. Uh, I'm responsible for certain of the subject matters, and then we submit the recommendation to the solicitor general. So there, there, there is um, uh, a lot of deliberation that goes into this, and I think it serves a number of valuable uh, functions. I think there's a real disciplinary function for, uh, for the people involved in making decisions and making recommendations. Because when you have to put your, when you have to put your thoughts and your reasons in writing, uh, it, forces, it forces you to think things through and it forces you to confront problems. Uh, that if you, just, if, if you just responded, hey, we lost this case and we want to take it to the Supreme Court, and that may be your visceral rea reaction, but there may be problems with maybe countervailing considerations. Uh, and so the, these memoranda that get written within the government, everybody involved in the process sees them, so you can criticize them, you can respond to them, to make sure that we have uh, ventilated uh, all, the, all the issues that may be in the, in the case, that we've exposed them, uh, so if there are weaknesses in the case uh, that the Solicitor General, uh, when he finally has to decide, will, will, will be aware of all problems. And we have a long-standing tradition in, in our office that uh, you're not expected to make a politically correct recommendation. You're expected to give uh, your best judgment as to what you think the government should do. And we put great stock in the independence, uh, independent judgment and recommendations of the attorneys who work in the office uh, because the system would not work if we weren't, if we weren't giving us our best views of what, of what we thought happen. So when, when, uh, uh, when, you, when you see that the government has taken a position in the Supreme Court or in a, in a lower court, it's the product of that kind of 
of deliberative process. It's not just something that the Solicitor General uh, sits in, in his office and decides what's the best thing to do in, in this case. It's the, it's the end product, the filing is the end product of that uh, deliberative uh, process. And the same, much the same thing happens with the draft of the briefs or the certiorari petitions uh, that, that we file in court. There will, we will typically get a draft from whatever division is responsible for it that would be commented upon by the other components and agencies of the government who are interested in that work we worked on, uh, worked on in, in our office. And um, one of the things we, we do is uh, we, we basically start over in looking at a case when it goes to the Supreme Court. I mean, the, the arguments will have been made in the lower courts, but we want to in the lower courts, they may be bound by precedent, or they may have a particular way of looking at things within that circuit. But when the case goes to the Supreme Court, they will be uh, looking at it themselves <coughs> afresh, and sometimes not um, not too impressed by what the lower courts have done. In the case I remember, I, I had this case probably 15 years ago called Central Bank of Denver the Securities Laws. A, a private damages action under the, under the securities laws and under Rule 10b-5, and the question is whether was whether you, not only could you hold the person liable who committed the fraud, but what about people who aid and abet the fraud? And 11 circuits had held that you can have uh, liability on the part of aiders and abettors. Uh, I asked the SEC to tell me how many cases have been decided for that question. Uh, <laughs> In it, and, and I think they, they told them to stop counting when they got to 650. And I, I went into the Supreme Court saying, obviously, with this principle embedded in the law for the last 20 years or more, the Supreme Court surely will just go along with what the lower courts uh, had thought. Well, no. Uh, I mean, they, they looked at it afresh, and they were quite impressed by the fact that all the lower courts had, had come out the other way. And that is, uh, I think that's even truer today than it was uh, 20 years ago. The court takes a, a new look at things, and it doesn't view itself as just correcting things that are seriously wrong. It views itself as taking a new look, uh, look, at the, look at the law. So if, if they're doing that, we sure have to do it. And so that, that involves making sure that we've gotten to the bottom of all the legislative history, um, all, um, if it's an agency, understanding how that agency program works. Um, uh, just like the lawyer for any client, you want, to, you want to know your client's business, you want to know where the flaws, where, uh, where the problems are in the agency's program so that you're aware of them, so if you're asked about them uh, at an oral argument, you can give a candid answer. Uh, and, and I mean, a lot of you will face this in the future. If you have, a, if you have an institutional client, it's still a client, and, it, and it, it's an important part of advocacy be able to tell your client's story uh, in a way that is uh, puts the uh, best light uh, possible on the on the client's uh, business, but but being prepared to, to explain to the court where there are problems and and some of the most awkward, but sometimes some of the most um, gratifying arguments is where you really have to say that you know things haven't been working too well in this program, but they're changing it. They've adopted new rules. They've adopted new policies, uh, and and so you're you're sort of able to come clean with the court in that way. That overall, the the, the agency is still right with these problems. They're correcting them, and you're, you're trying to get that point across to the court. And I've, I've seen that I've seen that happen several times. So one of the important roles that we have to play in the office is is to, is to ask tough questions, to challenge, and to study hard. Um, to to, uh, to be uh, to be prepared, uh, particularly when you get to oral argument, because the justices now are so active on the bench, they are so smart, and uh, and there are questions that can that, uh, can come out of the blue that you that you wouldn't uh, necessarily be uh, wouldn't have thought that would be asked, uh, but you have to be prepared for them, which means you have to basically educate yourself about things that aren't necessarily in the record. Unlike a lot of lower courts, uh, the Supreme Court uh, feels quite prepared to ask you questions about how things work, even if it's not in the record. Uh, for a number of years, 
10, 15 years ago, I represented the Social Security Administration in disability litigation. And uh, in, in those cases, I would be asked questions. How many claims are there? How does an administrative law judge handle this particular type of issue? None of that was in, in the record. Uh, but they want to know because they're going to be making decisions for the whole country. You know? And so they want to know these sort of legislative facts or programmatic facts so that, they're, that they will be making their decisions with full knowledge, full knowledge of, what's, uh, of what's going on. Um, so all of that goes into the preparation of our, uh, of our briefs and then in the, in the preparation for the, for the oral arguments, which are, which are daunting um, now because the justices are so active. Um, and you need to be prepared going into the argument to know that what are the three or four things that you feel like you must say and you have to work them into an answer to a question. Uh, even if you haven't, uh, even if you're not able to uh, expound at the, at, at the beginning of the case, you may only get a few sentences of your presentation out before you hit, uh, before you hit with, uh, with questions. Um, so that, that's a, um, that's sort of a description of, of the role of the Solicitor General uh, vis-a-vis the Supreme Court. Um, and I thought I'd also talk a little bit about some of the, some of the ways in which advocacy before the court has changed or, or some of the things that have, that have uh, happened in the years. One of them I mentioned is the nature of oral advocacy is so different. That you, you are no longer in a position to speak several paragraphs and you really set up your argument in a very, in a very logical sequence. I think in the lower federal court you typically have more of an opportunity to do that. But in the, in the Supreme Court uh, you don't. But also, the, the nature of how the court thinks about law has changed. Uh, when, I, when I first came um, to the department, uh, and when I was first in the Solicitor General's office, you could argue a case, uh, you, you could start your argument or start with thinking about the case, often in a, in a, in a, a variety of different ways. You could start with the policies of the particular statute start with the legislative history, you could start with precedent. But, but nowadays, if you have a statute uh, that is an issue in the case, the analysis of the case is going to start with the statute, and it's going to start with the, with the textual interpretation, uh, and maybe you can bring in some of these other, other things, but we, have, we, have, we, we now have a situation in which the court approaches legal questions in a very textualist uh, manner, and that's, that's very different from the way Um, the, um, it, it, it's the old way, in a, in a sense, even in statutory cases, had a, had a common law feel to it. Where the court was really looking at the, at what were the, what, what was the intention of the legislature, what was the uh, experience over time of a, uh, of, of an administrative uh, agency, and it, there was sort of a continuum in the development of the law, uh, and it's also illustrated. Chevron decision, which the Supreme Court says that courts are supposed to defer to the views of an administrative agency. Before Chevron, which was probably 25 years ago, and when I first came into the office, when you were explaining to a court why it should defer to an administrative agency's view of what the statute was, <coughs> the theory was that they were experienced they had accumulated expertise over the years, and therefore they were in a better position to know what the true meaning of the statute was uh, than the court. Well, Chevron and, and, the, and the court's analysis of Chevron after that really changed the theory. The theory is that there's a delegation to the agency uh, to choose among a range of policy choices. Uh, and, and so, it, but, but then the, the, the law turns on what the the agency actually decided, rather than the sense that the agency is a participant in this sort of common law development of what a statute means. It's, it's an explicit recognition that the agency has been given a responsibility for uh, interpretation. Uh, so that, that's, uh, that's I, I think, the, the, been the principal change in the way the court has thought about the law. But um, another striking thing that has happened, particularly, I guess, probably in the last 30 years, is the, um, the, the very large number of cases the court has had um, concerning 
structural issues under the Constitution. When I was in law school, we had no course on separation of powers. Our constitutional law, of course, did not have anything about presidential power. Uh, had, it had things about congressional power and the limits on the Commerce Clause and that sort of thing, but not the interaction of the branches, and particularly not mm -hmm. presidential power. Um, and there was virtually nothing on federalism. Uh, and because there really wasn't much uh, by way of Supreme Court precedent uh, between sort of the 30s, there was a little bit of that until we got uh, to the 80s. But beginning with, uh, with I guess I would say, uh, INS versus Chadha, the legislative veto case in the early 80s, uh, and right around the same time, things and more with which the court upheld the president's power to enter into a settlement with Iran with our hostages there, which, were, which was a, an affirmation of presidential power in, in, in the midst of the crisis. Beginning with those cases, and then through the independent counsel case, Morrison versus Olson, uh, the court has had a series of separation of powers cases, including one just last term, uh, the free enterprise case that concerned the president's uh, appointments power or limitations on and it had been had been since really the thirties when when there were those sorts of questions about presidential power had come before the court. And we've also seen uh, over that same period of time the development of the law and the, and, the, and the structural relationships between the states and the federal government. Uh, the developments in the Tenth Amendment um, area where the court has been sensitive to the federal governments of Congress is trying to commandeer the states into, into uh, uh, carrying out federal programs. Uh, many, many cases involving the 11th Amendment, the sovereign immunity of the states, which um, uh, is, is, I think, both important in its own right, but I think emblematic of the, of the, of the way in which the, the Supreme Court views the important role of the states as separate sovereigns uh, Country. None of that, none of that was really much in the public consciousness or the legal consciousness uh, uh, 30 years ago, uh, and I think it extends to cases like Bush versus Gore on the election of the president, uh, and then I think it would also extends to the Supreme Court's uh, cases uh, dealing with the habeas corpus rights of detainees at, at Guantanamo Bay, where the, the, the court has stepped into into that area um, both. In some instances, uh, restricting the president's power, or in some instances, uh, overturning Congress's attempts to regulate the way in which claims by the detainees of Guantanamo Bay would be, uh, would be uh, handled. Now, habeas is not necessarily a separation of powers uh, issue as we think of it in a typical habeas corpus, where, where a convicted criminal defendant is trying to get his conviction set aside, but in, but in, the, in the wartime context, it, it, very much a separation of powers uh, issue. And so that, when I, when I reflect back, I think that uh, the, the, the court's role in, in policing separation of powers has been, uh, I think, one of the most significant uh, developments over that, uh, over that period of time. And, and it's been, uh, I, I've participated in, in some of those cases, and, and, and actually a couple of the most rewarding situations were working on uh, the early separation of powers cases in my, in my career particularly INS versus Chadha, uh, where to, to work on that, I went back to the, all the sources on the, on the origins of the Constitution and the Federalist Papers and the, and the debates of the Constitutional Convention um, to uh, look for the, the, the executive branch was arguing that the statute providing for the Congress to have a one house veto of actions taken by the legislature of the executive branch. We argued that that was unconstitutional as an interference with the President's uh, execution of the laws and it gave Congress the power to control the executive branch without passing the statute. Um, but in, in, in looking for arguments on that, I went back to uh, uh, those original sources and I was struck. And in fact, it, it, was, it was sort of um, chilling up and down my spine, frankly, when I saw that the reasons why the framers set up a system with a bicameral legislature and the president being able to veto legislation all played out in Chadha itself. Chadha was a case, it was a, an alien who was going to be deported. Uh, 
Um, but there was a situation in which the Attorney General had the authority and the discretion to suspend the deportation of an alien if he thought that the uh, individual had equities, uh, which, which would warrant his staying in the country rather than being deported. But the, the statute provided that one House of Congress could veto the Attorney General's decision to suspend the deportation of an alien, which is what happened in this child. <coughs> well, one of the reasons why we have bicameralism, and particularly in the House of Representatives vetoed it, the framers thought that the House of Representatives, because it was so much larger, was likely to act impulsively. Uh, if you have only one house, it can, something can pass quickly if you have like one member supporting a particular thing, it's easy to get consent, not easy, but it's easier to get consent of, of other members of the House to <coughs> pass it. Uh, it's easier to corrupt legislative process or the decision-making process if you, uh, if you um, only have to approach maybe one committee or one committee chairman or something like that to get a uh, to get a law passed. And you would also, if you allow uh, one House of Congress to do that sort of thing, then you would be um, a much greater potential for instability in the law because the, the president who has the veto power is able to and who's responsible for executing the laws and has this experience, if his decisions could be changed by a, a unicameral legislature, then, um, then uh, we would have, as, as the saying went, a, a government of men and laws. Well, in Mr. Chada's case, uh, the resolution uh, uh, vetoing his suspension of deportation was passed in the middle of the night by the House of Representatives probably three people uh, on the floor at the end of the session. It was reported out of the Judiciary um, Committee, House Subcommittee on Immigration and Judiciary. Um, and uh, a couple other aliens in the same situation didn't have theirs vetoed. Uh, he did, right around the same time, and I don't, I, I've never known whether there was any connection. But the then chairman of the, of the Immigration Subcommittee House of Representatives, Joshua Bauer, was convicted for taking bribes <coughs> from aliens who are seeking uh, immigration. Uh, and, and so it, I've always wondered whether the reason that uh, Mr. Chato was vetoed is that he didn't play uh, along. I mean, it may not be true, but, but the potential for it, the synchronicity of having that happen at the, uh, at the same time, you had a situation where the Attorney General had made a considered judgment under the law, and you have this, this uh, the House of Representatives swooping in and, and changing that. Uh, it looks uh, not like the government of the laws, but it looks like more like the government of the whim. Um, and uh, if that had been subjected to uh, a bill having to go to the Senate and then to the President, there would have been more deliberation, there would have been a chance for a second look at it, a chance for Mr. Chada to uh, approach the Senate Judiciary Committee or to uh, uh, approach the President. So it was, it was actually very moving to see that, that, that the foresight that our framers had in setting up the separation of powers uh, uh, under, which, under which we operate. And I had a similar experience in working on the, um, the Independent Counsel case in which the court upheld the, the Supreme Court upheld the method for appointing independent counsel have them appointed by a three-judge panel of judges from the D.C. Circuit rather than by the President. And um, probably <coughs> most of you don't, uh, most of you weren't around or weren't following the news during the, during the independent counsel era in the, in the 1990s uh, when, when Ken Starr was appointed as the independent <coughs> counsel to investigate President Clinton. And the independent counsel was appointed by three judges. Well, one of the things the framers said about appointments is you ought to have one person be responsible for making an appointment because that person can be held responsible. And if you and if you need political accountability, then the Senate can confirm that person. It's all out in the open, and that person has has um, really the legitimacy that you or the, 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 the principal qualification you need in, in a democracy, which is that you've been selected in an accountable way. Uh, but but uh, that system provided for a three-judge panel to make a, an appointment in secret, not subject to Senate confirmation. And so you, you had an independent prosecutor with this kind of power without 
without having the transparency of the appointment process. And, and so there was always a question about the legitimacy of the appointment. Um, that, that at least it, it, it gave political fodder to the claim. I'm not saying there was anything illegitimate about the appointment. What it did was to uh, give it a lightning rod for people to criticize it, whereas if it had gone through the process that the framers had set up, then, then it would have been recognized as politically accountable uh, from the beginning. Uh, so I'm sure you all in your careers have those experiences where you, you come across something that, that uh, uh, I, I guess, uh, renews your faith in the, in the constitutional system that, our, that, our, that the laws you'll be working with has, has, uh, has sprung from. I, I've had those aha moments, sometimes late at night, when you probably had in studying for exams or whatever. Uh, but th those are also moments, uh, moments to cherish uh, uh, professionally, and, uh, and I think also times uh, for reflection when, when you're doing across them. Um, I'd like to stop now and, and just take any any questions or uh, thoughts, observations, whatever. Yep. You mentioned Chata pretty extensively. Chata is an example <laughs> of when the executive decided not to defend the constitutionality of a law, and that's obviously relevant with the Attorney General's announcement yesterday regarding DOMA. I guess that you can't comment on DOMA specifically, but what's your view on the executive's role in interpreting the Constitution and determining whether or not they're going to defend the constitutionality well, of the statute? Well, Ch Chata falls into a category um, that, that um, in several categories of cases in which the um, uh, Attorney General might decide not to, uh, not to defend a, stat a statute. Chata, uh, was a situation where there was a, a separation of powers issue and executive power. And in that situation, the, the um, Attorney General has always uh, represented the interests of the executive branch, um, uh, even, even though a reasonable argument could be made uh, on the other side. And in fact, in China itself, the House and Senate both um, intervened in the case um, and in the Court of Appeals and in, in the Supreme Court and presented a oral argument uh, in defense of the of the statute. Our view was that the House and Senate did not have standing as a constitutional matter, but that they, that was the position we took in Chata, but they were certainly um, uh, in, in position to file an amicus brief to, defending the statute. That's the same thing that happened in, in Morrison versus Olson, the independent counsel statute. We, we took that position there. And, it, and there was a, a, a uh, sort of the first in that line of cases is a case called uh, United States versus Lovett, uh, which was a situation in which Congress passed a statute barring payment of salaries to uh, some federal employees on the ground that they were thought to be subversive, and the executive branch took the position that, that was unconstitutional for a variety of reasons, the separation of powers, one's bill of payment. The Court of Claims struck it down, but the Solicitor General filed a certiorari petition in the Supreme Court, even though he agreed with that result, so that it could be taken to the Supreme Court and then the Senate um, Participated arguing arguing its side of it. So those separation of powers cases are really a, a, a distinct um, category. Yeah. Um, just following up this question, it almost seems like when the attorney general decides to stop defending a statute, it's an, it, it has an every turn of like an executive appropriation of um, like legislative or judicial power. I was wondering um, over the years what other statutes or policies the executive has ordered the uh, attorney general to stop defending. Well, there, there have been a number of cases over the years. I don't, I don't know. Um, in, in recent years, the, uh, there's a statute requiring the Attorney General to report to Congress when a decision is made not to uh, defend a statute. And I forget the number, but there's um, probably 60 such uh, situations that are, that are uh, in, in those. Uh, and that there are situations in which the Attorney General has concluded that there's not a reasonable argument in defending a particular statute, uh, looking at the Supreme Court uh, case law in the area, uh, and uh, seeing you know, the principles in the Supreme Court's cases, um, how they bear on the particular statute. So there are a variety of different contexts in which they, in, in which it's, uh, in which it's yeah. You spoke some about how much more active the court is now during oral arguments. What What's your, opinion on the, the kind of real contribution that oral arguments make to the way the court decides an issue versus just what's contained in the briefs? Um, 
one obvious answer is it's hard to say because I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, on the inside making the decisions. Um, I, I think it varies. Um, my my guess is that the oral advocacy may make more of a difference in cases that are that have subject matters that are new to the court. Um, and um, the, ju the, the justices who've been on the bench a long time have seen, you know, for example, a whole string of Fourth Amendment uh, <coughs> cases, and they, and they will have developed them. They'll, they'll know the case law, you know, extremely well, and they will have, you know, developed. Views about it, but uh, sometimes the most rewarding cases are the ones that involve some obscure statute that the, that the court hasn't necessarily thought of before, uh, or an obscure and ambiguous statute where you have some latitude on how you on how you present it. And I think in those situations, um, maybe you have a, a more of an ability to influence the way the court will come out of, come out on it. At least it feels that way when you're preparing it. I mean, you, you, because you. It, you're, it feels like it's starting, if you're doing something new, you're not necessarily uh, developing, uh, developing um, at, the, at the margins. Uh, but there is, a, there is a lot of creativity uh, in the law. My, my non-lawyer friends don't quite understand how law can be created, but it is. But it is. I mean, uh, being an advocate is, is figuring out what's the, best, what's the best way, what's the best language, what's the best perspective, how could you, how could you uh, paint a picture of your client's situation in a way that will elicit sympathy. And in, the, in, in that category of cases, you're more likely to be able to have the freedom to do that because you're not constrained by precedent uh, and you, you may have more sympathy. You know, um, you're a more, more um, fresh look at it. Anybody else? Oh. Uh, um. You were saying that the, the, the style of argument has changed from uh, you know being able to get through and develop your argument before being asked a question to having a much more active bench now. And that uh, in the Court of Appeals, you uh, may have a polar bench initially and be able to get them to develop your argument on your own more. I think you said that now you aim to have four points that you want to communicate and you have to work those into answering questions. Uh, I was wondering how you prepare for arguments, and uh, whether, whether you know whether it's a full you develop you know a couple paragraphs if you want to get started on, or whether you don't even bother to do that because you think you would be asked questions, and then how you um, what your strategy is for approaching how you're going to argue. Well, um, I always prepare, almost always prepare a um, written statement. First of all, let me say, things vary. When we're a party to the case, we have a half an hour on the side of um, And a half an hour is a fair amount of time, but probably half the cases we're in were just an amicus supporting a non-federal party. Like in, in, I don't know, a Fourth Amendment case, where the case comes out of state courts, we will almost always participate in a criminal case involving the Fourth Amendment issues, for example. And the state will often see us 10 minutes of the argument time. So in that situation, your whole argument in 10 minutes, so things have to be compressed. But what I, what I do for preparation is I, it's, it's usually like a page and a half double space type, which is, which is my sort of oral summary of argument. Uh, I never expect that I would be able to deliver that. But what, what, it, what it really is, is, is an attempt to boil down the essence of the case. Uh, after having looked at it, fresh at the time of the argument. Oftentimes the briefs will have been written uh, three or four months before that. Uh, and, and you sort of haven't thought about it much. You're looking at it again, and you're looking at it again. Maybe the reply brief has come in, or maybe there was some issues that you knew were out there at the time you wrote your brief, but you just decided not to say too much about them because let's see how let's see what happens. But you get it, you're approaching the argument, and you say, well, I guess I'm going to have to have an answer for that. Um, and also, some uh, the, the oral presentation has just necessarily has to be simple. So what? I, so I do that page and a half because it's a discipline to say how can I boil this maybe complicated case down to whatever that is, 20 sentences. I, I'm not sure how many sentences uh, that is. And I and I, I really go over that fairly carefully. And what often happens, I'll, I'll often be able to get out the first couple of sentences, uh, which I will have more or less memorized. But the other sentences and phrases that I've worked on will, 
you know, leap to mind uh, as what, when, I'm, when I'm about to answer a question. So, so it, it, even though I don't, even though I don't read the whole thing, the, the, the discipline of going through the preparation helps me to focus on what is, what are the, what are the three things that sort of expands on that. And then the other thing I do in terms of taking things to the podium, some people go up without anything at all. I, 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 even if I never look at it, I have to have a piece of paper uh, in front of me. It's like a security blanket. No, what I'm, I'll, I'll have, I'll have like what, uh, maybe the three issues and, and maybe two or three bullet points underneath it. This is, the, this is the issue that I have to address. These are the two or three things I have to say about it. And again, the discipline of just putting it down in bullet points helps me uh, to remember when I'm standing up there because you really don't have time to look at your notes. So that, that's, the, that's the culmination of the preparation. <coughs> it's the culmination of preparation times spread over a week, two weeks, three weeks. We, we always have two full two full courts um, from an, of an hour each followed by, by a question. And there's a very uh, rigorous new courts. So you're uh, very seldom does something come up at oral argument in the Supreme Court that, that is, isn't at least similar to something you were asked. Our office who attended and people from the agencies and people in our office who have been Supreme Court law clerks or have, or have the experience, they sort of know what the justices are going to do, what they might be interested in. Uh, and, and through that, through that, you, one way or another, you, you, know, you sort of try to identify the issues that, that, will, that will come up. It, it, it takes a lot of preparation time. I think we actually have about 10 minutes left, so it'll be oh, appropriate. Oh, okay. Well, then I, I don't know if... Um, no, uh, please come back tonight at 5 o'clock uh, for the uh, <coughs> presentation of the Silver Tongue Award and for the final round of the Newport competition, and also for the wine and beer. <laughs> thank you. Please uh, join me in uh, thanking Mr. Newport.